Tony, if you go to the state of Minnesota for the first municipal district, is now in session. Kendall will come around the presiding. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Ms. Kina, did you wish to approach? Are we using the podiums this morning, or are we to stay? I'm going to, if you'd be seated at this point, when I invite you up um, to make your argument, you'll be using the podiums. So let's call the state of Minnesota and Sandra Grazzini Rucky, file HACR 15 2669. Council, please note your appearances. So, Captain Kina, on behalf of the state. Uh, Stephen Griggs, we are on behalf of Ms. Grazzini Rucky. We're scheduled for sentencing today. Ms. Grazzini Rucky. Uh, was convicted of counts one through six of the criminal complaint following a jury trial. She was found not guilty uh, of counts seven and eight. Following the return of the jury verdict, a pre-sentence investigation and psychological evaluation were ordered. Reports have been filed by both the Community Corrections Department and the forensic psychologist who conducted the psychological evaluation. Council, have you received copies of each? The state has, Your Honor. There was an amended PSI that was filed. I believe there was yesterday in light of the fact, I believe the PSI writer reviewed the order for uh, an amendment of the complaint and adjusted her recommendations accordingly. Correct. And uh, the so state has received the amended PSI and the psychological evaluation, and the state would did bring that <coughs> the fact that the probation agent used the complaint rather than looking at the uh, amended order or the order amending the complaint uh, brought that to our attention. And in addition, uh, in looking at the credit for jail time, the PSI provides for 114 days. I was reviewing that again yesterday afternoon, and according to my calculations, the jail credit should be 133 days. I don't believe the PSI writer took into account the in-custody time that Ms. Brazzini Rucky spent in Florida when initially arrested. Mr. Grigsby. I have received a copy of the uh, PSI and the psychological evaluation. <clears throat> All right. Do you concur with the 133-day yes, custodial credit time? Yes, sir. All right. Is the state ready to proceed to sentencing? It is, Your Honor. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Ms. Keenan. Your Honor, before making my sentencing argument, do you first want to hear victim impact statement, or would you prefer to have that at the end? I'm I'm very willing to look to listen to the victim impact statement at this time. Okay. Uh, at this time, uh, David Rucky would like to provide a victim impact statement, and uh, would you like him at the podium? Yes, now? please, Mr. Rucky. Why don't you step forward, please, Ms. Kina? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would like to echo some of the comments made by Mr. Rucky during his victim impact statement and take a moment to thank some agencies and people that were instrumental in bringing Sandra Grazzini Rucky to justice. I would first like to take this opportunity to thank the Lakeville Police Department and the U.S. Marshals Service for their efforts in locating Sammy and Gianna Rucky and bringing them home. I would like to commend the efforts of Michael Broadcorp and Brandon Stahl of the Star Tribune. Had it not been for their efforts, we never may have located the girls. They provided, they provided us with information that caused a major break in the case that allowed us to pursue this prosecution. I would like to thank Lisa Elliott, Mr. Ruckey's family law attorney, for her tenacity and tireless efforts in seeking information in the family court case as to the whereabouts of the girls. I would also like to thank Lisa and her staff for the assistance that was invaluable to me during my trial preparation for this prosecution. When one looks at this case, I, uh, after completing the trial, I, I told folks in my office this was more complex and complicated than trying a first degree murder case because of all the tentacles and, and all the family court issues. Finally, 
I would like to commend the efforts of David Ruckey, a father who never gave up hope and whose resolve and persistence served to keep the rest of us focused on locating his daughters and bringing those responsible to justice. As to the sentence the defendant should receive in this case, the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines limits what the state may request and limits what the court may order. The depri deprivation of parental right crimes the defendant was convicted of are all severity level one offenses, the, serious, the least serious level under the sentencing guidelines. Because the defendant has no criminal history points, the most jail time she can be required to serve is one year and one day. So unfortunately, Mr. Ruckey's wish of 944 days is not an option in this case. In no way does a sentence authorized under the sentencing guidelines adequately address or reflect the seriousness of the defendant's actions in this case, as outlined by Mr. Ruckey. Be that as may, the state is required to argue for a sentence that meets the parameters of the sentencing guidelines. With that in mind, the first question that needs to be addressed is what counts this court may enter convictions on. Minnesota Statute 609.035 provides that if a person's conduct constitutes more than one offense under the laws of this state, the person may be punished for only one of those offenses. However, there is an exception to that rule and that exception is the multiple victim exception. Under that exception, courts are not prevented from giving a defendant multiple sentences for multiple crimes arising out of a single behavioral incident if, one, the crime affects multiple victims, and two, multiple sentences do not unfairly exaggerate the criminality of the defendant's conduct. With that exception in mind, the state is as to Gianna Rucky. Now, conceivably, there, there are many victims in this case, but when we're trying to determine the victims for purposes of entering convictions, the state believes that the cleanest, uh, bulletproof, if you will, way of doing this is to focus on whose rights were actually deprived here. And, and, and look at those people as the victims in this case for, for purposes of sentencing. So that would be David Ruckey and Tammy Love. As to the sentence itself, the state is requesting the court to follow the recommendations of the PSI with some exceptions. First, rather than stacking the probationary term as recommended by probation, the state is requesting that the defendant just simply be placed on probation for a period of four years, which the court is allowed to do under 609.035. The court has the authority to either, uh, well, the statute provides that the court can uh, place a person on probation for either four years or whatever the maximum sentence is, whichever is longer. In this case, the maximum sentence is two years, for the crime, and so the state is just simply requesting that it be a four-year probationary term. Second, that the defendant be required to serve 133 days in jail, credit for time served, uh, which she has satisfied that requirement. And Your Honor, the PSI was recommending additional jail time and specifically was recommending that the defendant serve 30 days jail commencing on April 19th of each year that she is on probation. And obviously the significance of that date is that that is the date that the girls went missing back in 2013. While I appreciate the rationale behind that, I personally made a promise to a young woman uh, who was a witness in this case, that when I met with her and saw the trauma 
that she was going through and experiencing with the thought of having to appear in the courtroom and testify against her mother. I made her a promise that I would not request any additional jail time. And I'm going to keep that promise. I want to be very clear that the court did not I, engage in this promise, and the court okay. is learning of it for the first time I, today. And, Your Honor, I advised her that that wasn't my decision and that ultimately was the court's decision. All right. But I'm just personally, I, I, I made that very clear to her. All right. The other reason why the state is not requesting any additional jail time is with having served 133 days, Sandra Grazzini Rucky has basically, if, if you include good, good time, has basically served approximately six and a half months. And with only a year and a day of jail hanging over her head, the state feels it's also important to have an adequate amount of time hanging over her head to serve as an incentive for her to comply, comply with her conditions of probation. However, uh, that doesn't prohibit the court from uh, sentencing her for more jail time, but the state would also ask the court to consider sentencing alternatives. And specifically, the state is requesting that the defendant be required to serve 30 days in the sentence to service program, and that that be completed on or before December 31st, 2016. The PSI uh, recommends no contact with David Ruckey. The state is requesting that that be expanded to include uh, no contact, direct or indirect, with Tammy Love. And that she be prohibited from having contact, either direct or indirect, with Samantha Ruckey unless approved by the probation department. The state is also requesting that the defendant and anyone at her direction be prohibited from engaging in any harassing conduct against David Ruckey, their children, and Tammy Love, and that would include any internet postings. We have reason to believe that Ms. Grazzini Rucky has been making postings on a vacation rental by owner site that Tammy Love has and has been posting negative comments about supposed stays that did not occur. We also have information that Sandra Grazzini Rucky provided a copy of Samantha's interview that was provided in this case, provided that to so-called bloggers and posted, which were posted on the internet. It's that type of harassing conduct that the state is asking the court to pro prohibit her from engaging in. Finally, there is uh, the Rep Crime Rep Victims Reparations Board paid out $10,000 in this case to Mr. Ruckey, and that pertained to the reunification costs, and there was $5,000 uh, for each child. Uh, the state is requesting that that be made joint and several with any co-defendants that may be convicted, namely Deidre Evavold and Gina and Doug Dolan. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Does the state rest? Mr. Creeksby. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> <coughs> uh, good morning, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to sort of just outline what I think are the uh, technical legal parameters for the sentencing. I don't disagree in, in 
uh, essence with what the state said. But I think that uh, there's uh, some important distinctions and that uh, it's, it's clear here that uh, this is a single behavioral incident with a single criminal objective, uh, but there is an exception uh, for the multiple victim. And what that would allow the court to do would be to sentence consecutively if there are multiple victims, and I agree technically there are two victims, there are two people who are rights holders pursuant to court order, Tammy Love and David Ruckey. But this is also an important dimension to that, and that the court cannot apply the multiple victim exep uh, exception if it would unfairly exaggerate the criminality. Now, let me say this in, in support of that. Uh, as a technical victim, Tammy Love is, is, is essentially just that. She was never um, a custodial parent. She was not a surrogate custodial parent. She was uh, a person who the court decided to entrust um, the children's custody to on a, on a very temporary basis. And it was, in fact, a temporary basis and was eventually um, given to the father. Now, uh, the, and, the, and the reason why that happened is because in the family court proceedings, the court had decided at that point that the father was not uh, suitable at that time to be the uh, custodial parent. So what I'm suggesting is, is that the court does not give us uh, any strong, clear definition of what would unfairly exaggerate. So we have to, in some way, sense of what sort of the, what the most common sense would be. The most common sense meaning is that if it would unfairly exaggerate if you were to take somebody who is a technical or, or a virtual victim and treat that person as, as somebody who is uh, uh, sufficiently involved and sufficiently injured by the criminal conduct to warrant a consecutive sentence. And I su respectfully suggest to the court that as a technical matter, this would be an example where uh, consecutive sentences with uh, Tammy Love as the secondary victim uh, would unfairly exaggerate the nature of this sentence. Your Honor, may we approach? Yes. I'd like, I'd like the microphone to be, can we cut off the microphone, please? Yeah, I'll leave it Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, mo moving on to my next point, that um, I want to emphasize, uh, just despite uh, the, the fact that in every situation where a person commits a crime and there's a victim of this crime, and that victim is Mr. Rocky, and he explained to the court precisely in what terms he fairly is a victim of this crime, that there are nevertheless um, factors to consider in mitigation. Um, first, that they're, they're, the only evidence that uh, we, we have of what started this was a very unusual, contingent, sort of a spontaneous affair where the children, the, the two daughters, reacted badly to the court's uh, custody order, ran into the streets without their shoes on, afraid, and then begged their mother to help them. Now, whatever, whatever judgment, whatever error of judgment that resulted in the conviction that uh, Ms. Grissini Rucky, that the evidence showed Ms. Grissini Rucky uh, committed after that, the, the original situation was in essence untenable. There was really no good way out. She was prohibited at that time from having conduct, and the girls gave her essentially an ultimatum you either help us or we're going to run anyway. Now, uh, I think that the, and, and, and the, in essence, the jury's verdict reflects uh, in some part an agreement with uh, uh, the, the initial uh, conduct. But I say that because I think it's pertinent to whether or not there's the possibility of reoffense and the conditions of probation. The uh, PSI has identified no factors to suggest that she's at risk for reoffense. And indeed, the kind of situation that prompted the chain of events that led to the conviction here are almost certainly never likely to, to recur again. Um, as the uh, I, I don't think there's any objection on, on behalf of the defendant, Ms. Grissini Rucky, to a no contact order with either Tammy Love or, or David Rucky. I, I don't think that this is a problem. But I think it is a problem when, um, 
uh, Samantha Rocky, who has not been here or nor offered, was contacted to offer her opinion, who's now, I believe, 18 year old and a, the age of majority. She's not technically a victim uh, of this case, and there's no evidence before the court that this would actually even be in the interest of Ms. Uh, of, of um, uh, Samantha Grazzini Rocky, and I don't think the court would be within its um, authority to impose a no contact order on somebody who was not offered uh, an opinion about whether that contact order uh, is even desired or not. Um, cer certainly, uh, there's, uh, it's reasonable that there are family court orders in place that would have to be followed, whether they're conditions of probations or not. There's no objection to um, having those continue as a condition of probation. But I also want to uh, suggest that uh, I, I heard the court sort of s suggest that uh, it was not party to the promise. And, and I, 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 that, that's absolutely true. And I don't know if that it was indication. I suggested, I stated emphatically. C correct. And, 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 and there's no doubt that that is, there, there is no question, whatever prosecutor promises are made, that the prosecutor does not do the sentencing here. So, so in essence, I, 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 I got the sense, right or wrong, that the court uh, did not uh, mention that emphatically because the court did not believe that that was a sufficient punishment in this case. In, in essence, Ms. Grissini Rucky was uh, given sort of what would be a standard average punishment long before the trial happened through her uh, pretrial incarceration. She uh, only has the balance uh, of, of a probationary term to serve yet. And so the court, it, when it comes down to the court has a decision with respect to the entirety of the sentence, but in the term, in the harshest term, which is the uh, term of incarceration. The court can essentially maximize the term of incarceration, which would be to um, impose the absolute harshest penalty the court can impose on Ms. Ms. Grissini Rucky that the law allows. And I think in, in, in this case, that type of uh, uh, harshness is, is not justified. And I think that there's sort of a tendency to say, well, if the crime is really bad, then somehow it inevitably follows that the punishment may be bad. And the notion is that bad things beget other bad things. And, and I think but there's a, uh, uh, a skip side uh, to that one, too. And that is that there's, a, there's an unpublished opinion out there, uh, and I, I, I only cite it in, in the abstract that way, that talks about the quality of mercy that, that the court can perform. And I understand, and, I, and I've been around long enough to hear the response to that, which is that, well, did the, did the defendant show mercy to the victim? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. And so what, what the court can do is the court can do one of two things. The court can say, well, uh, I'm, I'm simply going to act primarily out of satisfying the uh, desire for vengeance of the victim and to inflict as much harm and in the harshest term that the court can allow because bad things beget bad things. But the other side to that is also mercy begets mercy and grace begets grace. And that we all come into court here, and we always expect, uh, at least my clients do, and, and every other defendant, fears the power of the court, understands that the, the court can inflict uh, pretty serious, irrecoverable uh, punishment upon a person. That is that, that deprivation of liberty. But it doesn't always have to be that way, that there's another logic to punishment. And the logic is redemption, and the logic is, is the future. At some point, the children, Grissini Rucky children, don't want to necessarily today have a judgment from this court that it errs on the side of foreclosing a future relationship. That even as you get older, even in your 50s, 60s, if your parents are still alive, these relationships are precious. And it seems to me that uh, with the probationary term, the court can satisfy whatever supervisory powers the court has with respect to Ms. Grissini Rucky, but to err on the side of the harshest sentence is in, this, in essence to say, I'm simply foreclosing the future with you, I'm going to punish you maximally, I'm going to wash my hands of it and let the future take place. Well, defendants don't expect mercy. 
uh, especially when 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 a uh, victim like Mr. Rocky gives a uh, moving statement with respect to the children, and everybody expects the harshest penalty. But I suggest to the court that it's written nowhere that says the quality of mercy cannot be get an additional mercy, an additional grace. And I would ask the court to consider that in terms of sending a message to Ms. Grazzini Rocky that fairly punishes her, that fairly supervises her, but tells her that the future is also important and that this is an opportunity for redemption and not just simply uh, enduring the court's uh, uh, punishment. Thank you very much. Does, thank you, Mr. Grigsby. Does Ms. Grazzini Rocky wish to speak? I would like to invite the PSI writer, Ms. Olson. All right, thank you. Would you step forward, please? Thank you for being here today. You are the you are Lydia Olson. You are the PSI writer. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And we have received copies. I have received copies both of the original pre-sentence investigation report and your amended report filed yesterday. Um, you have been in the courtroom. You've had the benefit of hearing the presentations here today by Ms. Kina, Mr. Rocky, and Mr. Grigsby. Do any of those arguments or presentations change your recommendations? Um, they, do, they do not, Your Honor. I would change the jail credit to 133 days. Um, I did not account for the time served in Florida. And also, after hearing Ms. Kina, um, it does make more sense to s um, sentence on count one and three. All right. All right. Thank you for being here. Let me have you take a seat. Mm -hmm. I just have one question. Yes, yes. I invite you to stand for sentencing. Why don't you come up to the podium, please? During this morning's hearing, I was deeply affected by Mr. Rucky's victim impact statement. First, Mr. Rucky in his eloquent and heartfelt tribute to family, the strength of family, and to his children, described his relationship with the five Rucky children, the five Rucky offspring, who I have learned are vibrant and unique individuals, each in their own right. He lovingly described his relationship with his children, and he described the impact of the events that led us to this day. <clears throat> Mr. Rucky described defendants' acts as the annihilation of the family. Truer words have never been spoken. The senselessness of these events have haunted each member of the Rocky family since April 19, 2013. The pain and the loss that each family member has endured is beyond comprehension. My heart aches for you. We do not live in isolation, and surely we are all reminded today of the ripple effect that one life has upon others. 
I was also touched by Mr. Ruckey's words about a family that endures, a family that heals from trauma and pain. This is never an easy process, and it's often a process that bumps along, lurches along, two steps forward, one step back. A sentence will never heal the wounds that Mr. Rucky and the children have suffered. A sentence will not bring back precious time that was lost and experiences large and small that you all should have shared together. A sentence will not take away that pain. Ms. Grazzini Rucky, the jury's verdict was clear. You were found guilty of six counts of deprivation of custodial or parental rights. During the trial, you claimed and you have always claimed that you acted in the best interests of your daughters, that you acted as a loving mother. If so, it defies logic that you left your three other children in the custody of the father you claim was abusive. Your animosity for Mr. Rucky robbed you of good judgment, and it robbed your children of stable sibling relationships and the important connection to their father during formative teen years. Your animus towards Mr. Rucky spilled onto others, including the, professional whose the professionals whose paths crossed yours. There is a saying, my way or the highway. And on April 19, 2013, you literally took to the highway with your two daughters because you did not get your way in the family court proceeding. And those two children remained missing for 944 days. The family is the cornerstone of our society. I'm not a psychologist, a social worker, or an expert on child development. I am, however, a mother, a grandmother, and a judge. I believe without hesitation that our community, our children, your children, need and deserve the guidance and love that a father brings to their lives. Mr. Rucky was deprived of parental rights to two of his precious children for 944 days. And it is true that the law, in terms of these crimes, recognized the victims as being Mr. Rucky and Tammy Love. The true victims include your children, all of your children, especially Samantha and Gianna most directly, but also the three children who were left behind and who remained behind. In sentencing you today, I have tried, to the best of my ability, to base the sentence on the facts of the case, taking into account all of the circumstances that are legally relevant. My sentence is based on the facts and the law. I strive by this sentence to do justice, a concept on which reasonable people can differ, but a concept that is based on fairness, on accountability, and on community standards, as those standards are codified in law. The starting point for determining the sentence is this, and indeed in this, and indeed in every criminal case, is the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. The Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines establish presumptive sentences that specify the duration and the type of disposition. The sentencing ranges provided in the guidelines are presumed to be appropriate for the crimes to which they apply. And under Minnesota law, judges are instructed to pronounce a sentence within the applicable range unless there are substantial and compelling circumstances that support a departure from the guidelines. In this case, deprivation of parental rights is a severity level one crime.
You stand before the court with a criminal history score of zero. The Minnesota sentencing guidelines call for a presumptive stayed sentence of one year and one day. In other words, the sentencing guidelines presume a probationary sentence. I find that a dispositional departure from the guidelines is not appropriate in this case, and I am going to uh, comply with the Minnesota sentencing guidelines uh, and not depart whatsoever from a guideline sentence. I thank the PSI writer Lydia Olson for preparing a thoughtful report and for making well-reasoned recommendations for sentencing. I also thank Dr. Gregory Hansen for his thorough and insightful psychological evaluation of Ms. Grazini Rucky. Sandra Grazini Rucky, having been convicted of count one, or having been convicted in count one of depriving another of parental rights, concealing a minor, your daughter Samantha, from her parent, you are adjudicated guilty of that offense. You are sentenced to serve 12 months and one day in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. Execution of sentence is stayed, and you are placed on probation to the Dakota County Community Corrections Department for a period of three years. Having been convicted in count three of depriving another of custodial rights, concealing your daughter Gianna from her custodian, Miss Love, you are adjudicated guilty of that offense. You are sentenced to serve 12 months and one day in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. Execution of the sentence is stayed and you are placed on probation to the Dakota County Community Corrections Department for a period of three years. Your probationary period on count two will run consecutive to your probation on count one. So your total probationary term is a term of six years. You will not receive an early discharge from probation. Should your prison sentences be executed, they will be served concurrently. The terms of your probation on count three are identical to the probation conditions on count one. I am going to be imposing sentence to service and confinement periods for each year of your sentence. And the confinement periods, the annual confinement periods on each count will be served concurrently, as will your annual requirement to, per to uh, perform sentence to service. So, as to the conditions of your probation. First, you will serve 250 days in the Dakota County Jail. You will receive credit for 133 days actually served. By my tally, you have 34 days to serve on the original term of confinement, and you will be taken into custody today to serve the balance of this confinement period. You will serve 15 days in jail during each year of your probationary term, and your 15-year day uh, jail sentence will begin on November 18 of each year, the day the girls were recovered, beginning in 2017. So this day is the anniversary of the day the girls were recovered and returned to the care of their father. Your sentence on count two is consecutive to count one, as I said, for a total probationary term of six years. So you will surrender to the Dakota County Jail at 8 a.m. to serve 15 days on each of the following days, November 18, 2017, November 18, 2018, November 18, 2019, November 18, 2020, November 18, 2021, and November 18, 2020. You will serve 12 days of sentence to service during each year of your probation, beginning in 2017. You will complete all 12 days of sentence to service by November 17 of each year. If you fail to complete each and every day of your sentence to service by November 17 of each year, you will surrender to the Dakota County Jail on November 18 of that year and serve 12 additional days in jail above and beyond the 15-day annual confinement period. 
You will pay restitution to the Minnesota Crime Victims Reparations Board in the amount of $10,000. Your restitution obligation is joint and several with any other person who may ultimately be held responsible for restitution in this case. You will also pay restitution for any past or future uninsured counseling expenses incurred for therapy provided to your children and for family reunification therapy if such a claim is made. Restitution will be determined by the Dakota County Community Corrections Department. On count one, you will pay a fine of $944, $1 for each day your daughter, Samantha, was missing. On count three, you will pay an additional fine of $944, $1 for each day your daughter, Gianna, was missing. In addition, you will pay a surcharge of $80 as required by Minnesota law. You will have no contact of any form direct or indirect with David Ruckey or Tammy Love, and neither you nor anyone acting at your, at your uh, instruction will commit any acts of harassment against either Mr. Ruckey or Ms. Love. <coughs> you will comply with all family court orders. You will attend individual therapy and follow the recommendations of your therapist. You will follow the rules of the probation department. You will provide a sample of your DNA. The Dakota County Community Corrections Department is authorized to release the pre-sentence investigation report and the psychological evaluation report to any court-ordered program. There are 10 standard conditions of probation that apply to your case, and you will find them detailed in the sentencing order. You are adjudicated guilty of counts two, four, five, and six. No sentence is imposed on these counts. <coughs> I wish to close with a very brief word to Samantha and Gianna. And Mr. Rucky, I hope that you will um, share these with your daughters. Samantha and Gianna, you are courageous, smart, strong and resilient. You are loved and appreciated for who you are. Helen Keller said, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Samantha and Gianna, you are on your ways to overcoming the conflict and the challenges of the past. I hope that you reach for your dreams and live your lives knowing that you're strong and brave. That concludes the sentencing. I have uh, one matter. Yes. Record. And that is that uh, I'm going to ask the court to stay the sentence pending an appeal. Now, uh, the, the, the standard for doing that is, first of all, whether there are whether or not the appeal to be taken uh, is simply for delay. Now, uh, the court presided over this trial. The court uh, knows that there are several legitimate issues that may not ultimately uh, be, be prevailing issues, but, but certainly there were sufficient issues with respect to the court uh, to make the appeal not frivolous, but something that deserves at least serious consideration. Now, the court's decision to stay this is not an attempt to sort of predict what the appellate court would do. There's, there's simply no way that the court can do that. The court has already made the decisions that it found to be appropriate, and nobody's asking the court to review that. It's just a technical standard for deciding whether to say the appeal or not, that if the court believes the issues um, are, are simply taken for a delay, um, that are on their face frivolous, then, then that's, a, that's a reason to deny it. If the court does not find that, then uh, the court actually has to consider then um, whether or not um, there, what, what, what the harm to the public would be, what the, what the risk of flight would be, um, whether she's per particularly dangerous and her, her not being in custody would, would endanger the public. She's a 50-year-old woman with no criminal history. The court has released her on her own recognizance back in February. The court um, imposed a series of conditions on her. 
Uh, she has complied scrupulously with each condition. After the trial, the court once again increased the bail, which forced her to go into custody uh, and added a series of conditions. And that series of conditions also was scrupulously abided by. In other words, we have roughly eight months of proof that when the court gives a order and supplies conditions that um, uh, she's uh, not only willing and able to comply, but she's done nothing other than comply with those conditions. That eight months is an important uh, term because that reflects uh, on the more optimistic side the time in which the appeal would likely be heard. Uh, there, there can be at this point no consideration that she's a flight risk. Now she has been sentenced. She has a probationary period. She came into court today knowing that she was going to be sentenced. Uh, I, I have, of course, advised her that the courts, what, 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 what the court could do. Um, but the, she, the, there, since she's been released, she has provided the court the exact opposite of what would be evidence of flight risk, and that is compliance. Attended every court hearing, participated in her trial, and showed up for sentencing. So I'm not asking the court to suspend the entire sentence. Whatever supervisory conditions uh, uh, that the court has put on probation can be made in terms of the condition of release. I asked the court to do only one term of the sentence to suspend it, and that is the part that she can't get back if she were to prevail on appeal, and that is the term of incarceration and the alternatives. So I think that, that if, if you look at the factors, there is no credible argument she's at risk to harm anybody. No criminal history, and the only time in her life when, when she's ever deprived somebody of rights was not an assault, it was simply a, uh, the result of a transitory incident for which she's been punished if she doesn't win on appeal, that she'll have to serve. So she's, there's no argument that she's going to harm anybody, and she's not a flight risk. There's been at least two opportunities for the court to see her conduct when she was at liberty to flee, and she's always showed up to court. So I would ask the court to do everything, uh, and impose all the conditions, simply suspend the term of incarceration pending the appeal. Ms. Kina. Your Honor, the state is opposed to the request for a stay, and I don't know that the rule contemplates that this court, if it does grant a stay, can grant it in the fashion that Mr. Grigsby is, is indicating. Uh, when I read the rule, the court can grant a stay of mission where we want all or nothing. We, we want all. We want the sentence imposed today so that she's on probation and uh, although she has not fled, she now stands convicted as a felon and the state does believe she still poses a flight risk. And Your Honor, the, the trial in this matter, while there may have been issues, this court did a phenomenal job in trying that case. And I don't believe there's going to be any viable issues on appeal and that it was rock solid. And I have every expectation that it will be affirmed. And the amount of time that it takes for that appeal to go through the process will be at least one year. And that's a huge risk to allow her to be unsupervised out in the community for a period of one year. If I may respond briefly, I have actually litigated this issue in front of the Court of Appeals that the court only has the option of staying the entire sentence or not. In fact, I made this argument in the trial I had with Judge Wormiger, and, and the Court of Appeals issued a motion, uh, an order on the motion, saying that that's not the case. That the court is free to impose any consideration that the court needs for conditions of release. The issue is not whether, whether or not the court made the right decisions. Every court is presumed to have made the right decisions before they go to an appeal. The, the sole narrow issue is that there are certain dimensions of punishment that if you prevail on appeal, ultimately renders the appeal um, meaningless. That, that, that you've served your time, you've, de you've been deprived of liberty. It's the exact same logic that we use routinely to punish people for taking vic things from victims that they can't get back. 
So the court doesn't have to engage in an analysis of whether you're likely or not likely to prevail an appeal. If she doesn't, she simply starts serving her sentence, the exact same one the court imposed. The sole consideration is whether or not she has the right to be spared the incarceration if she were to prevail on appeal. The rule provides that when an appeal is filed, and of course it has not been filed, you stated your intention to do so, but the rule uh, provides that the filing of an appeal does not stay the execution of the judgment or sentence unless the court, unless the district court judge grants a stay. I decline to grant a stay at this time. I will follow up with a written order. I think the old rule also requires the court to state its reasons. Yes, and I will follow up with a written order. Thank you. Thank you. You're remanded to the custody of the sheriff.